grass-fed products. And the uh, speaker for this session is uh, John Hopkins. Uh, him and his family run uh, Forks Farm LLC in uh, the Forks Farm Market in Northeast Pennsylvania, uh, where they raise, graze, process, and market 100% grass-fed beef and lamb, uh, pasture poultry, and free-range eggs. Uh, they direct market all of their pasture products through custom orders, retail sales, uh, buying clubs and farmers markets, and its demand has exceeded their farm's uh, production. And they partnered with other grass-based farmers uh, to market and distribute their products as well. So that will go ahead and uh, turn it over. Uh, sound okay with everybody? Sounds loud up here. Uh, so I'm the guy that gets to after lunch on the last day, <laughs> on a day. So be forewarned, I just purchased one of these, I thought maybe for my wife, but if anyone falls asleep, I'm going to have to. Especially after that chocolate. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about you folks. Um, who here is uh, grazing beef cattle? Okay, uh, other species, any uh, sheep? Poultry? Pigs? Goats? Yeah, good, pretty good mix. How about marketing? Um, how do you guys sell uh, conventional market, like take them to the sale market? Anybody know that? Yeah? Some. Some. Direct marketing? Um, okay, like as custom bowls have, that kind of thing? Okay, anybody doing retail cuts? Yeah, that's a pretty good mixture. Great. Well, um, I guess in, in a way I'm a little bit preaching to the choir, which is good because we can kind of ignore some of the things that were said today and at lunch um, about what overall market conditions are, even though they influence our business. Part of the idea of direct marketing, of course, is to set your own prices and, and set your own market. So, a little background as to who I am and why I'm up here talking to you guys. Um, I'm originally from Northeast Pennsylvania, and in 1980 ended up in the state of Wyoming, in northwestern Wyoming, up in the Tetons as a, as a horse wrangler. Uh, on a ranch there, and then ended up down in Colorado, where I studied forest management at Colorado State University, and also continued um, be fortunate to be working on ranches horse back and, and kind of got into the cattle grazing thing through, through my wrangling out there. And then in 1986, uh, I married my wife from Northeast Pennsylvania, and after a couple of years out there, we ended up back um, in Pennsylvania and bought an 86 acre farm that had been abandoned for a couple of years and decided that we wanted to own our own animals and do our own thing. So we bought uh, a half dozen Herford heifers and bred them, and I was in the cow business. And I kind of took my marketing sense or my, my business background that I learned in Wyoming, um, where I was working for a cow-calf operation, and um, come weaning time in the fall, we sold all our cows, we came in, and we weaned them, and then we had a couple buyers from feedlot coming in, offering prices, and usually the high price um, build the trailers and we ship all our cows out to tractor trailers in the fall and just take care of our mama cows in the winter and start over again the next spring. And so I we really wasn't very much in contact with the market and that market pretty much sold us what our cows were worth. And so when we started raising our own calves, my first experience marketing was to take my weanling cattle, which I was very proud of, um, first set of six cows and put them to the local sale barn and got my check back in two days and I was really excited and I got the check and I sat down and I kind of started pencilling things out and then I realized, oh, well, this isn't even going to cover the cost of training a cow for you. And that was my introduction to the ownership of the cow business. Um, I of course found out that because my cattle weren't black hiding, um, there was a deduction taken out for them because um, there seemed to be a preference for black cattle in the market. And it really had nothing to do with the quality of cows, and I didn't know who bought them. I knew what they were paid, but I had no say in it. And about that time, we read about a guy by the name of Joel Salatin. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard of Joel. And we ended up going down to his farm in Fort Virginia, and he introduced us to the concept of direct marketing over 
relationship model. And you know, when we get into this, we like to scratch animals behind the ears and um, graze our properties and watch the grass improve. But a big part of what we do is we're producing food. And we have found that there's a much greater return in a number of senses, uh, not only monetarily, um, but many different ways of knowing where that food is going and having a direct relationship with the people that are, are buying our food. So today uh, at Forks Farm, um, we've been in business almost well, 27 years. Um, every year for the last several years, we've, we're marketing um, about 90 head of finished 100% grass-fed cattle. Um, we raised about 70 hogs last year. They're all raised outside um, on pasture in wood lots, and we're using them to help develop solo pasture. And we raise and market about 40 lambs and uh, about 3,500 uh, pasture chickens and uh, several hundred turkeys and many eggs. So we have a variety of farm products and they're all coming from the grass and now it's our job as farmers to manage the multiple species. But all of our products, we process all poultry on our farm um, and then we use the US, both USDA and custom processes, processors for our red meat. In Pennsylvania, we're fortunate enough to have the exemption that if you raise poultry and process it yourself, you can market it free of inspection. Whereas if um, I raise, I process my neighbor's poultry on my farm, then they would consider me a processor, and I would lose my exemption to sell my own poultry. So we quickly found out the nuance of the below on, on what we can do in the way of processing. And uh, it's our goal to sell 100% of the products that we have directly to the consumer. So we're, we're here to talk about marketing today. And to me, this is the gist of it, okay? The dollar exchange is happening there. We've got multiple generations. Um, we even have um, one coming in the background there. And this is our classic customer. It's, it's a family person. Uh, many times it's a mother. We're a wife, um, and the concern for children uh, is, is, is important. And that's how we got into grass finishing beef um, when we had our, our first daughter and started discovering about things like antibiotics and hormones in beef and how they can affect um, those that are eating. The marketing is all about the transaction. <clears throat> we have a very unique product. A grass-fed product is different. And there's a lot of arguments of whether it's better or um, nutritionally different or why is it more expensive, etc. And I'm not here to take up that argument, but it is different. It's raised differently, they're handled differently, we sell them on a different scale. And if you're direct marketing, you're selling them to a different customer, really. It's not the average American maybe that's coming out to your farm and buying grass-fed or an organic product. And along with that, I have to say that now has been the best time in, in my 30 years of grazing, I don't think there's ever been a better time to be marketing the products coming off of your farm. And for a number of reasons. Antibiotics. Okay, there's a number of health conditions that have come to our attention in the last 10 years. And many of those health conditions are due to the foods that we're eating and how those foods are processed. And that's where the uniqueness of a small farm comes in and how we're raising our food. Um, there's obesity, there's hypertension, there's a concern about what farmers are putting in their animals, on their ground, on their crops, the type of crops they're feeding, and how that influences the food that, that we're eating. 
Joe Robinson's book, Why Grass Fed is Death, was one of the first books to come out. Um, now we have Michael Pollan, we have Joel Salas, and there's been numerous people that have followed up and have gotten major press, books, Omnivore's Dilemma, movies, um, New York Times articles. It's mainstream now how we're raising our foods and how it's affecting us as consumers. And you know, this is what the reality of 90, 95% of the beef that's raised really in the world, and certainly in this country, is it's going through a feedlot. And we're starting to see the repercussions of that, not only to our, ourselves, and of course to our animals, and the buffers, and the things we have to feed an animal in this situation, but to our environment. Um, any of you living in the Chesapeake watershed are well aware of nutrients and what they are doing and where those nutrients are coming from. And we all think of ourselves as kind of the white hatted guys because we're farmers, um, but we're not always perceived that way. And so it's really up to us to let our customer know, hey, what we're doing is different. So we have to have that discourse, and if you're direct marketing products from your farm, this conversation never stops. We constantly have to be telling people what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how it's different, and how that might affect them. And people are looking for the information. I think the consumer um, can be confused with all the things, the terms that are bandied about, about being natural or grass-fed or organic or naturally grown. There's so many labels and, and certification programs these days. I often tell people, that we are not certified, but we're 100% certified by our customer. Okay, so we're not certified by any outside governing body other than our customer. And that certification process happens by us explaining to our customers exactly what we're doing and inviting them out to the farm. We want to be fully transparent with them, invite them to the farm, and let them know how our products are different than what they can get at the grocery store. Okay, again, this is the reality of most of the turkeys that are grown in this country. And this is the reality of turkeys that are raised on a small farm. And the difference in that can be seen visually. If you put together a, a, a fresh egg from uh, a pastured chicken or a piece of meat from a pastured animal, it looks differently. You can see the yellow in the fat. You can see the tone of the skin. Um, it doesn't have an odor when you cook it. The fat that measures out of it is a clear gold color, not that, that gray murky color. And so we've been reading about this, that how you raise an animal makes a difference. And we got curious as to whether we could prove that on our own farm. So we went together with some other farmers. We formed the exact same protocol, like beef was 100% grass-fed and had no inputs, uh, was used in a rotational grazing system, was processed and, and aged in a certain way. And um, the chickens, the eggs were coming from a, a free-range um, system. And we got a share grant, and we had our products tested for standard nutrient content, but also some of the things that are unique to grass-fed meats, like uh, conjugated linoleic acids and the essential fatty acids um, and the omegas. And to see, was what was happening on our farm really true from the literature we were reading? And you can see here, um, for our pasture eggs, less calorie, same protein, a uh, uh, third less cholesterol. And then look at the omega-3. We have almost 300% more omega-3 fatty acids than what you get from, and these, these poultry are fed uh, grain, but they're, this shows you the influence of pasture as a supplemental um, uh, uh, feed source for them. You can see the difference. One of the things that I do when I go talk to groups, um, is I'll buy a dozen eggs at, at the quick mark on my way to the talk, and I'll bring a dozen eggs of my own, and I'll track them. Okay, which egg came from the pasture? One on the right? What is that? It's coming directly from the grass. That's a real egg. That's beta carotene, vitamin E, coming right out of the grass. 
So visually, like there's an aha moment. Okay, you can you can put tables in front of people and say nutritionally it's different or taste it. That's subjective, but if you show them, um, that's one one method that we have of telling our story and differentiating. We also like to have some Americanas and some different breeds so that we get a different looking egg. We don't want them all white. We don't want them all the same size. We have bullet eggs. We have eggs coming from three year old hens. You know, when you go have breakfast, sometimes you're in the mood for a couple of small eggs. Maybe you want a nice big double yogurt variety. You know, and that's stand, that's what's contrary to the industry. So again, showing that variety uh, visually is important. We follow through to see, okay, how about the chicken, the meat chicken? And again, we're mimicking the same thing. It has less calories um, and less saturated fat and more uh, vitamins. And again, that's all coming out of the grass. And so we use this method. We do the same thing for beef. Again, 100% grass-fed beef. 40% less calories, a little higher in protein, but the saturated fat, the fats are what really makes the difference. And we're trying to get our cattle as fat as we can on grass. Um, and we're doing that by selecting the breed and managing our pastures and um, definitely making pulling decisions based on how well animals are doing. But the point here is that the way we're raising our animals and how we're feeding them and pasturing them makes a difference in the quality of the food and we need to be getting that word out to our customers because this is one of the things that they're looking for is a healthy, unadulterated food source. And when they hear that and they hear how the animals are raised, I think it takes a lot of the questions out of, out of their mind and they can partnership. Um, entering your products in competitions, uh, getting your products out there uh, to people that are eating them. Um, we hand out a lot of samples and if we do well, um, we let people know about it. We're, we're proud of it. This all relates to telling your story and I know everybody in the room has heard that, that said and that's what we're doing is we're telling our story. It's homespun, it's real, it's honest, and only we can tell our story. And our story is different for each of our farms. And that's why I'd encourage you to do is tell the story of your farm, why you're in it, why you're passionate about it, why you raise 100% grass-fed cattle, for your, pa your poultry animal pasture, what that means to you, what that means to the animal. And you know, there's many ways you can do that, calling the press in you know, on a processing day, that's one way. Um, having a newsletter, uh, we, we have a printed newsletter that we send out every spring for years. And, it, and we had different people write in it, we quote different articles, um, and we had an order form in there. And that's how we were getting our word out. And now with the internet, constant contact, um, survey, monkey, MailChimp, all those things that we have access, it just is easier and it's less costly than going to a printer and taking the time to, to arrange something like that. But there's many different ways we can, we can tell our story. Telling people about the uniqueness of your farm, um, again, Kraft can't do that, and uh, ConAgra can't do that, and Smithfield Meats can't do that. Only you can do that, and your farm is your farm. So if you've got a historic resource on your farm, if there's something that makes your farm unique, um, we have the Josiah Hess covered bridge on our farm, and we encourage people when they come out to the farm to take a walk and walk through the bridge. Um, we have a little spot down by Huntington Creek, and now we have a lot of our buying clubs and our customers come and camp out. And that enables them to stay on the farm. We have their kids help us collect chickens. They get to swim in our creek. And that relationship, that bond, just gets tighter and tighter. And that, again, is something that Big business can't do. They're, they're, big business is not going to have people come out and stay at your farm. So we're going to produce a product. We've, we've decided that we're going to make that product into a food, and we're going to sell that food directly to someone. And we're going to determine how much they can get, when they can get it, and what it is, and how much they're going to pay for it. Those are big, big items. How can we sell it? And basically, you can sell wholesale, custom, and retail with your meats. And within the wholesale, we can sell conventional. We can 
We can have an order buyer come to the farm. We can take our animals to um, the livestock market. And then we can take their price. Or we can sell wholesale ourselves and say, well, yeah, I'll sell you that whole beef and it's going to be so much a head or so much a pound. We can sell custom. We can sell half a beef, a whole, a whole beef, a quarter, an eighth. Uh, we do ground beef packages, and now people are getting creative with putting together like a steak package, or Joel would call it um, a country club package, or a roast package, or a stock maker's package. And that kind of targets some of the things that people are looking for, and it can be a seasonal thing. You can mix species, or we can sell retail. And obviously when you're selling one cut of meat, you've got to sell it a lot more. You're going to need a higher price because you've had to go through special things to have that meat cut and packaged, and you're going to probably store it, and you may be delivering it. So those are all things that add costs on, and we need to be very careful as farm owners and business owners that we keep track of all those costs, and that those costs are blended in to the price of the product. Not just going to the grocery store and saying, oh, you know what, ground beef is $5 down at, at White's Market. I should be able to get $6, or I want to get $4.50 and beat their price. That has nothing to do with our cost and our product. But our prices have to come from our animal and the cost that it takes to raise that and a reasonable return of the product. That's only fair to us and our animals and our customers. So within, oops, Within the processing, almost all of us have to rely on an outside party uh, to process our meat. Is there anyone here that's processing their own meat? Okay, so we are all reliant on a butcher. And um, with red meats, it's required, at least in our state, um, that we go to an inspected facility. We've looked at doing an on-farm processing facility, but we just decided not to go there for, for a number of reasons. But this is the one point that we lose control over that animal that we had total control of from the day of birth, from the day of conception, before conception, to when, almost to when we put it in someone's frying pan or in their refrigerator. We have total control over that animal, except when you load it on a stock trailer, and have someone slaughter it, and then age it, and then cut it up, and package it and label it. And those processes are huge. You can take the best meat in the world and have the worst meat coming out if it isn't processed right. You can't take the worst meat in the world and make it any better by a good processor. So it's up to us at ground one in our pastures and in our systems to produce the absolute best quality product we can do. We do that with good management, with good husbandry skills, with, with moving our animals, with being a veterinarian and a true stockman and having compassion and lining up the system. Like when we're shipping animals, we bring them down into our shipping corral a couple days beforehand. We bring them as a group. We keep them as a group. We ship them as a group. We make sure that they are in a facility a few hours at least before they're slaughtered. And these are all things that keep stress low. And we talk to our butchers about no electric pods, no pitchforks, no yelling. We go and check out the, the front end or the, the hind end of the processing facility, the holding pens, the chutes. Do they have do they have water there? Are they clean? Do they have enough room? Are your animals getting commingled? The processing itself, how are they slaughtered? How are they aged? These are huge factors in quality. And we have to participate in that. You can't just take your animal and drop it off the butcher and expect to pick up great meat that's just going to happen because I'll tell you what, it's not going to just happen. And this is the weak link in the whole chain far as I'm concerned, and talking to people really around the country where we talk and where we practice grazing, this is a consistent problem in the United States of America for small farmers these days. And it's a huge opportunity for all of us to create that relationship, 
to support a local butcher, to put a young butcher in the business, to do it ourselves, to do it for other people. It's not an easy business. Farming isn't an easy business. The process is. It's dangerous, it's expensive, um, and it's not really sexy. Although there are guys that are making it sexy now, and um, I think there's been a, a resurgence of processing and the knowledge. Um, just to point out, the yellow fat on the right, grass fed. The white fat on the left, grain fed. That visual difference. Okay, these guys are extremely critical to our success. And we were, we've worked over the years with probably a dozen butchers, anything from a small scale mom and pop, just two or three guys in the shop, to larger USDA facilities that are doing wholesale restaurant business um, and customers. As I said before, if we don't have a good product going in, we're not gonna get a good product going out. So we have to be focused as a grazer, as a producer, on producing the best quality product that we can. We need to have that relationship. We need to know our butcher. They need to know what we need and what our concerns are and how we want to process it. And we've got to put it right out there to them. That we're paying these people good money. They're earning it, but they've got to tell the line as well as we do. Okay, we have to meet them halfway. There's a, different ways that you can process, there's different ways you can handle um, aging, whether you dry age, whether you wet age, do you hang it for five days, 10 days, three weeks? Those are all things we work out. <coughs> uh, we worked with one butcher and we were finding we were getting off flavors. And we weren't hanging much longer than seven to 10 days and why was that off flavor? So we started monitoring the, the temperature and the humidity in his coolers and what he was doing is he was killing all his product for the day, maybe six carcasses, and letting them naturally come down, uh, temperatures lowering down, hanging out during the day, and then he'd slide them into the cooler at night. Well, what happens when you put something warm into a cooler? It raises the temperature. These carcasses were very moist. It raises the humidity level. Then that would start to go down the next day. If you didn't kill for a couple of days, then it got down and it stayed steady. And then he slaughtered again at the end of the week, and it would come up. Well, that fluctuation doesn't make for good aging. So sometimes you've got to be in there saying, hey, you know what? We've got an issue here. And our guy actually put in a free cool, and that was expensive for him. Um, and you know what? These guys are so busy now, you bug them enough, they can say, you know what? There's the door. I've got enough people behind you. I really don't need to ask them. That is one attitude people will take with you. And, then, and if they do, then you need to use that door and find someone that will work with you because if you turn out a bad quality product, you're gonna have that sale once. If you turn out a good quality product, product will come back. How we package it, paper versus shrink wrap. Having a bone guard on the shrink wrap um, so that you get a good seal and that seal stays. Um, having the label put on. Choosing the, how you cut up. Um, any of you that are involved in that process know that you can cut up a carcass many different ways and that greatly affects the, the dollar return that you're getting and what your customer might want. Wow, I didn't even know I had that. That's so cool. Okay, so retail products, um, we're selling one package of ground beef rather than the whole beef. We're going to have to get more for that single pound than we would if we sold the whole beef we're going to have to sell more of them to sell that whole beef. And it's easier to sell one package, one pound, than it is a whole beef. Um, and it's, so that expands your market potential. You've got that little old lady who wants some really good tasty ground beef, but she's not going to buy a quarter. It's just her and her husband, and they don't have the freezer space. So now we can sell her that one piece, and we can sell that at a farmer's market. It's hard to take a whole corn carcass unless you're like in the soups in Marrakesh, um, <coughs> you can hang the, the meat there and they come up and buy the head or by the side. We don't do that too much in this country. So um, having it cut, packaged, frozen, labeled, you can take it 200 miles off the farm and you can sell it that day. If you don't sell it, you can bring it back. Um, but there are issues with that. So it, it changes things. Uh, and 
you know, a customer, if, if, if they're buying feed the right way, they're getting a quality product <coughs> less from the farmer than the, what they say they pay if they went to the health food store. Okay? We do a lot of samples. We hand out a lot of food. We give away a lot of food. And I don't think I've ever given anything away that didn't come back in some kind of return. Even if it's like a really good steak and it's a $15 cut, well, what's $15 for marketing if that person could come back and buy a beef for $2,500 from you for that year, tell their neighbor, and then come back year after year after year? We have a lot of families that have been with us for 15 or 20 years. Okay? We're not going to make as much selling that one pound of ground beef as we would if we sold the whole beef. And there's a lot more time, storage, you know, we have a delivery van, that's expensive. We have a walk-in freezer, the electricity to fire that freezer. We use cold storage off the farm, so we have to store meat there and go pick it up and bring it back. It's not easy, folks. They're, all of a sudden, you're in the logistical business of being a grocery, and you've got to consider that. Sometimes it's nice just to scratch ears. And so that's something that we need to be realistic with ourselves is, you know, do I really want to get into this and follow it up? Um, to make it worthwhile. And you've got to be on the road all the time. You're always selling. We do a market every week um, at our farm uh, to sell our products. And once you start selling by the cut, it's not like they're just going to eat that in the fall when you finish your grass-fed beef and then they don't eat ground beef until the next fall when you've got more ready. You get them hooked. They're going to want to come back. And one way we do deal with that is we encourage people when they become regulars to go custom. They can get it cheaper, they can get it bulk, they can have a custom cut according to their instructions, and custom package. And they have it for store, storage down in their freezer. All they need to do is walk to their basement. They don't have to go to the grocery store, they don't have to call us to have beef in line uh, and in stock there. But you start selling by the cut, you pretty much have to have it year round. We process uh, beef on our farm every month now. We do about four or five beef a month. And again, if you don't have quality, not going to come back. It's not going to lose sell. You've got to have quality. And we're growing a natural product. Things happen. You know, maybe an animal got stressed. Um, maybe the guy did poke it with a hot shot going into the to the chute. Maybe they misfired and it came up and there was stress at the kill. Maybe the humidity levels. Something can and will go wrong. But if you stand behind your product, and we, have, we t constantly tell people, hey, we gave you that sample, we want to know what you think. How is your, we, we do follow-up calls. After people order custom from us, we'll wait a month or two, we'll call them up. How is your beef? Any suggestions? Oh, oh, really? Okay. Then we can look back, what animal was it, where was it processed, and try to track those things down. If someone doesn't like our meat and they bring it back to us, we'll give them their money back, guaranteed. We, I'm sure that sometimes we have taken an impact, and I know that we've had issues, but we will exchange it, we will replace it, or we'll give money back, and people know that. And once they know that, they're like, okay, that's cool, and they feel like, hey, you know, John, that meat that we had last time, it's kind of a little dry. Okay, do we have a back cover? Do we hang it too long? Um, we need that feedback. So again, it's that relationship. And there are many more costs of handling when you're selling by the cut. And you've got to have cold storage and transportation. And they've been big steps for us to take on our farm so that we have meat on the farm year round. And now we really are getting up against the guys that are magicians of logistics. Because that's what Walmart does well. That's what the grocery store does well. They can handle truckloads of stuff. They have economies of scale. They have storage. They have those relationships with distributors and suppliers and all that. And that get that consistent product. You're doing it all yourself on your farm, producing it, processing it, storing it, selling it, a lot to undertake for people who want it. And you need to plan. If you don't have a butcher, you're out of luck. And you need labeling. Labeling is, is a big issue, it can be. Um, that's the first label we started with. And then so we, we have the USDA seal um, that you need right there with the plant number um, to, to be able to sell by the cut, and obviously what product it is, and then our name on it. And that's how kind of we started. But it says right there, the only meat plant, 
Okay, so they know where it was processed, but you know, we really kind of wanted to, to have four swarm on the label. And so we to, to go through the labeling protocol, you have to work with uh, USDA, the Food Safety Inspection Service. They need a name and a product, and any claims on the package, natural, grass-fed, certified organic. The more claims you make on a package, the more you have to substantiate that, and you have to have an affidavit signed that that is in fact true. Prove to them that that's true. And if you want to work with your, your neighbor, and you're short chicken, and you want to buy their chicken, they better have the same protocol, or you can't put your label on their package. So it's important. And you have to go through all these steps, submit a label, verify the claims, um, and I will say one thing about claims is, you know, the more claims you have, the more hoops you have to jump through. So maybe you want to make that claim verbally, letting people know how you're raising things, um, but not put it on a label because then you get into a whole other set of rules. Okay, big question, what can go wrong? Remember, we've raised that animal two years on our farm, 18 months on our farm. We bore that animal, we weaned that animal, we grazed that animal, perfect service to the butcher, make sure that everything happens great. Carcass is hanging, we have good back fat, and we are fine. Okay, then we get that back from the butcher. Sure, I've got your ground beef. It's really the best ground beef. This is so good, it's so nutritionally done, it's all on grass, no chemicals on it. Oh, here's the package. You know, that obviously happens with the plant. Okay, what's that? Okay, that's a little piece of meat in this big plastic thing, and it's, oh, I guess it's fillets. So there I've got like a 25 to 30 dollar pound cut of meat, a tenderloin fillet, and you can't even read what it is. And it looks like, you know, this little strip. Okay? So a lot of times the person that's actually putting that meat in the package, choosing the bag, putting the label on the bag, you know, all right, were we really thinking of where that label was going to go and how it was going to look nice and centered and they could see the whole label from a glance? No. You know, you've got someone maybe in there that's $7 an hour slapping something on and they're thinking about, you know, they're overdue for their mortgage payment or, you know, they just got a DUI last night and their mind is, way away from you presenting something to your customer that looks really professionally done and show the integrity of what's in there. You gotta be there, folks. I mean, I've got a friend that's in the salmon business. He's a fisherman and, and they market all their fish and he is going right into the plant and stood right next to the backpack machine and say, whoa, no, that's not gonna fly and here's why. And you gotta have a butcher, you know, a lot of butchers, they don't have the lightning skin when their plants come in there before you get fish. Are you going to do it? Are they going to do it? Are you going to work with them to do it? Can they do it right? And this makes a big difference. How your product is perceived. Okay, so we, let's say we got the product and it doesn't have blood all over it and it's perfectly packaged, perfectly aged, well cut, got a good shrink wrap on it, splash frozen, ready to go. You know it's super. How do I sell it? We have more venues now to sell our product than we've ever had before. And I don't know about you guys, but we get calls all the time since we're in farmer's market. There's not enough of us. We don't have enough product. And we have our own farm market on our farm. We know there's not enough vendors out there. So the demand right now for good food, direct from a farmer, exceeds the demand. And there's a number of ways we can do it. We use all of these methods. We started with custom. We started by handing out to family and friends and neighbors. And we started with custom. Yeah, we can go out for you. We can go a quarter for you. Okay? Then they said, hey, how about chicken? Yeah, we can go chicken. So we sold whole chicken. And then someone asked if we could throw a pig. Well, we can't show you a pig. So we can throw a pig. All custom. But then, you know, I'm just a little old lady and I really don't need a whole chicken. Can you cut it in half? Yeah, we can cut it in half. Can I sell one? Can I get one pound of ground beef? Yeah, we can do that. What you're doing on your farm directly relates to um, which of these venues are you're going to use. How much you want to do, where you want to do it. Um, we live in a rural area. One of our greatest markets is, is outside west of Philadelphia. 
Uh, I knew a lot of people down there. It's a two and a half hour drive from my farm, but those people have money. They're educated. They're living in kind of a rural area, but, but the city's creeping out. They don't have a lot of farmers. Up in my area, there's farmers everywhere, and they can get a dozen eggs for a farm. But these people don't have the access. So we drive that, that distance, we have to add more. <coughs> Farmers markets are great because you can look your customer in the eye, you can talk to them about what you're doing, you can show them pictures of your farm. On our farm, we can say, hey, you're here, you want to go out and see the cows? They're right out there, they're in the top 40. Want to go see the chickens? This is where we process, you'll see. We are processing shed, we also will process on Fridays and on Saturday we have market there and there's someone you know, selling honey or, or uh, flowers out of the processing shed. Um, they're there. They can see it. You can talk to them. You can you, you know them. You know their kids. The kids come up. You can give them samples. You can get a feel because you're looking them in the eye. You're talking to them. They, you can answer their questions. You can ask them questions. And so once we got over the level of just selling our products, people develop a trust and they're like, hey, do you know where I can get raw honey? Or, you know, you guys should carry fresh grape bread. Or, how about a vegetable CSA? So what we did is we had a chicken pickup day, Saturday mornings, we processed chickens. People had pre-ordered them, they came to pick up chickens Saturday afternoon. Um, for your cleanup activity, obviously. But then we realized, you know, that person that was here to pick up the chickens, she would probably do a chunk of cheese that's made by Melissa, our neighbor, if we had Melissa's cheese here. So we started carrying other people's products and saying, you know what, instead of pickup day, we're gonna call it market day. So we have an on-farm market. Now we have 20 to 25 local vendors. We're a producer-only market. We don't want someone going to the local vegetable sale and buying um, peaches out of Georgia, you know, in May and bringing them up and selling them. We want the peach producer in Pennsylvania selling his or her peaches at our at our market because we feel that that relationship and that transparency in creating a food network is, is what we're after. And we started in the mouth of the barn. My daughter and one of our neighbors, and this was Saturday afternoon now after processing. An old cutting butcher board, um, not the one we used to process the chicken, but you know, scale, hanging scale in the background, hay mound right there. I mean, it, it worked for a while, but then we realized, okay, we need a facility. So we had a corn crib that came down in the big snows in 96. We built this. And we designed it so that the front here, these doors slide open. We put an office of, on this end. We put a walk upstairs where we have our intern stay. And then this is a sales room. And then we can, we can slide those doors open during market days or during good weather. We have coolers in there. We have signage, cash register, scales. Um, so we have one farm sales. We have people self-serve during the week. On that counter, there's a cigar box and there's a, a tablet and our price list. The people can come in, they can get a dozen eggs, they can go to the freezer and get a chicken, they can get a pound of ground beef, they can get farmstead cheeses, they put their cash or check in the cigar box, they write their name in the book, the date, what they got, who they were, how much money they left. They're off the road, they go down the road. It doesn't matter what time of the day it is, we'd be coming in at 9 o'clock at night before one. One hours. Um, but we don't have to be there. The sale takes place on its own. Or we have a market day and we have a cash register and we help them um, get whatever they need to get. And there again, this is this is where the rubber meets the road in marketing is these days are huge for us. We we can gross five to seven thousand dollars in a day of our product and product that we purchase or resale from other local farmers. And then we have 20 other farmers on our farm that are exchanging their own monies and selling their products. And if you factor that in, you know, we're probably doing $50,000 on, on a Saturday, gross sales for all our community farmers. And that's going right to the eater. Tony and Ann make bread, do breads for us, wonderful sticky buns. Um, and they love it, part-time for them, and it's a big cash cow 
they come, they spend a, you know, a big boss of baking on Friday, they roll in, they open up their van, and we all like to move to help them back in the And that fresh is, that, that bread is fresh and warm, and it's a, it's a huge sell. Um, these guys, uh, he was a former chef, raises goats, does veal, he gets his carcasses slaughtered under USDA inspection, brings them back to his facility on his farm and cuts them up. And he does all these veal specialty cuts. He does it with lamb. He makes blintzes. He makes pierogies. Um, so he's mixing his abilities as a chef with his, his abilities as a processor and his abilities as a farmer. He milks the goats and he makes the cheese and then he puts that cheese in a blintz. Pretty cool stuff. He's doing all of it from start to finish and marketing it himself, burning in his life. And this is our processing shed. The day before, we slaughtered 200 chickens in there. Okay, all you need is a roof. Um, get it cleaned up, and so again, we're not being, trying to be fancy. It is what it is. And you can just hardly make it out, but that brown there, that's a huge compost. And we compost all of our opal coming from all. Of, so if we can't sell it, if it's a feather or blood or bones that we can't sell for super stock, it goes into the compost pile. If we have mortality out in the pasture pen, they go in the compost pile. And we add that with some manures, um, wood chips, straw, and then that goes back in our field. So we're trying to keep as much of our resources on our farm as we can. Uh, we have people doing vegetables, flowers. There's a lot of salmon in the background. Signage, people need to know what you're selling, how it was produced, how much it costs. You've got to be, I mean, if we're going to be open with people and tell them what we're doing, you know, we can't hide our costs, we can't hide any of the processes along. People want to know. And the more you have up, educating people, telling them what, what they want to know, the better it is. You've got to have your prices up. Um, we have prices up at the store. When we go to markets, we use a market board, stands right by our truck, has all our prices. And if we sell out of an item, we, we, um, we just cross it off. Um, and people can see, you know, oh, well, if you don't have to risk it now, can I get some for next time? You bet. Write your name down and the number. About our cheeses, where they're from, what types of cheeses they are. Uh, we have a gal that does um, um, rubber stamp printing, and she makes signs for us on canvas. We're big fans and, and members, and spend a lot of time and effort with the Pennsylvania Association of Sustainable Agriculture. So that's been a big part of our farm growth. Having, having a sign at the end here. Uh, coming up with a logo, putting in something like pasture products. Like, what's, what's a pasture product? Okay, maybe you have to explain it. Um, sampling is huge. I've already mentioned that. We give away a lot of product. One time, we, were, we so we cut up our chickens now. We sell by the piece, and then we put together soup and stew packages that are the neck and the back, and we also sell feet for people that are making stocks. Stocks are huge. Beef stock, chicken stock, um, pork stock, lamb stock. These are out of bones, folks. And they're very nutrient dense. And people are learning more about cooking. They're getting more of a kick on this. And they're realizing, you know, I, I paid like 11 bucks for that boneless chicken breast. But in that process, I've got a neck that has dolphin meat on it, really nutrient rich um, fat and skin. Well, we were sitting on boxes of this stuff. Like we're selling all the breasts, we're selling all the thighs. Oh my God, Allison, look at this. We've got all these necks and backs. So what do we do? Allison says, wait. She goes to you know a good cookbook, um, nursing traditions cookbook. We cook up some stock. We have it there for sampling. We have the, the book with the recipe right there. We sell the book. We have nutritional facts. We have pricing. Allison's handing it out. Um, we immediately sold out of next and backs. So if, if you have something, make it an opportunity. And again, do that by taking that step yourself. Okay, how do we cook this? 
um, what the price that we can sell it at when people can use it. Uh, pet food. We sell a lot of things that we normally eat composted for pet food. And you would believe that people would pay for their results. Um, sampling, you know, hire, hire the, the local kids. Um, Josh has a degree in culinary arts. He wanted to work on a farm, so he interned with us. Um, and we got to let him do his thing and cook on the big green egg. We've had big green egg, uh, that's the cooker there, ceramic cooker. We've had all these guys, these barbecue guys, come up and do their barbecue thing. Um, and all of a sudden, like barbecue guys don't often think about the quality of what they're cooking. Uh, we kind of opened our eyes up, like, okay, here, cook our meat for different, um, and, and cook it up. If you see what's coming out of the top of that cooker, okay, so people walk onto your market at 11 o'clock Saturday morning, and they smell that, you know what happens right here? And right here, okay, you hand them a sample, oh, that's good. Well, now we have people selling sandwiches. Uh, we make all kinds of things, but you know, sloppy joes or hamburgers, hot dogs, sausage, whatever. Get that, use that smell, use that visual thing to get people hungry, and they're going to buy. Um, branch out into different things. You know, there's there's more than you can do with that goat or that bull or that lamb um, with what came from fiber arts. We have a gal that goes to India. She did not make these things, but we thought it was cool what she was doing in supporting these communities of women that she had partnered with in selling their products back here. Um, Abigail's one of our neighbors. They buy a lot of food from us. She makes her pottery. It's a seasonal thing. Like She does really well for our Christmas markets. People are thinking ahead about gifts. Okay, do demos. Have, have an experience. Um, whether you're going to a market off your farm or thinking about doing something on your farm, um, educate people. Um, have them have fun. We have music at, at, at all of our venues, and we don't have to pay these people. We, we pass around a basket, 20, 30 different farmers giving a little sample of what they bought the market to fill a basket for the musicians. Those guys go home very happy. Um, and now we actually have people, musicians calling us like, hey, when can we book for next season? And then seasonal sales. Yeah, you're getting to the end of your season. Um, maybe it's not chicken time, maybe it's cold. Well, um, Ted and his wife, they, they raise Christmas trees right around the corner from our farm. So they come people, get people at our Thanksgiving market. They're not going to sell all their trees there, but they can hand out info and then develop a relationship. And then those people are going to, to Ted and Nancy's to cut their tree down at their place. Pumpkins are huge. Edible pumpkins, um, pumpkins for, for show. Um, we do events. This was this is with uh, the culinary school at Penn Tech. Chef Mike is a, is a big uh, promoter of local foods, and these are a couple of our um, our customers that have purchased a meal. Alf and, and um, Lori, they purchased a meal. Um, we've got our coffee roaster in the action, and some young culinary students. They come to the farm, use our foods to cook up uh, uh, this meal, and the money goes back to PASA to, to promote small farmers. We do field days. Um, this was actually with Joel Salton came up to our place because we had used Joel as a mentor and we came up with an idea through PASA that maybe it's good to bring um, the, the chief back to a farm that's trying to copy his skills and have them critique us, which is a little bit of a scary idea. But um, it brings like-minded people together we get to share ideas, and that promotes their business and, and your business. And maybe they become a vendor. Maybe they take these ideas back to their place. Starting at a young age, we think it's really critical to get kids out to the farm. My wife is a pediatric physical therapist, so she works um, with a lot of at-needs children. So we bring kids out that are in wheelchairs and in walkers and that really have special needs. And we put them on a horse, and we let them touch a, a goat and pick up a chick and collect eggs. And it's the first time these guys have ever done that. And it's, it's a memory that will last them, we hope, a lifetime. Let them know where their food comes from. They talk to their parents. They bring their parents back maybe from market. Um, and, and we're developing a customer at a multi-generational level. 
That's what it's all about. Like that touch, that feel, and that communication. Okay, that can only happen in your form. And I guess I would leave you with the thought that we can do something that no one else, whether they're a farmer or a businessman or a food processor, you can do something that they can't. And that's to develop that relationship with your neighbor, with your customers, and with their children. And it will snowball. You will gain momentum. You will get word of mouth advertising that you don't pay for, and you will get to a point like we do when we, we see other farmers that, whoa, we're past our scale. We need to partner with other people doing the like thing so that we can share in this, and that takes the burden off of any one person. It spreads the market out, and that's what gives us a solid food community. And I guess with that, um, the last thing that I'd like to talk about has been a, a, a huge <laughs> step for us with a buying club, which to me is like a Uber farm market. So a buying club is a group of buyers in an area, for us all farm, but we've taken that concept of all farm during the off season now. But what we do is we go to a farm market in an area that we think has potential. We attend that market every session that they have. We sell our products. But we have a clipboard there. We want their name and their email address. And so we, we compile a, a mailing app list. And then during the off season, we send out a notice once a month. Hey, we're coming down next Saturday to your area. We're going to be at the Devon Whole Foods at 1 o'clock. We're going to be at the Phoenix Mill Market, Farmer's Market at 2.30. We're going to be at Marie's House at 3.30. Go on to our buying site. We had a, a computer guy write a program for us that works real time where we can list all our products, how much it is, average weight, just food description, cost, how many in inventory. They can click on that. They can buy one dozen eggs. They can buy um, four pounds of ground beef, two pounds of bacon, whatever. Whatever's listed, they buy that. That comes back to us. We pack on Friday. We only take down what's ordered. That is automatically confirmed with them. They know when we're going to be there. They know what they're getting and how much it costs. We show up at Devon Whole Foods at noon. We pull up in the van. We bring the packages out. They step up. Hi, I'm Susie. Here's my check. Here's Susie's package. Boom. Very quick transaction. We go home empty. We only brought what was sold. A farmer's market, you go and you hope you sell what they have. And if you take Kiko, you want a quarter ounce. And if you take quarter ounce, they want to zero on there. You know, it's always shipping. Um, you have to take more than you think you'll sell. Sometimes you sell out. With this, it's a guaranteed sale. We pack it at the farm where we have the time to pack and distribute, get it all together. It takes the time of delivery. It takes the vehicle. It takes cold storage. But the first year we did this, we added $60,000 in sales to buying clubs only in the off season. So come November when farm markets shut down and you don't have a lot of product, we have the benefit that veggie people don't have. We can, we can process our product in October and sell it all winter long. So we do that through buying clubs. Um, there's more information about that uh, with uh, Sherry Salatin, Joel's daughter-in-law, uh, is running their buying clubs. They have like 3,000 people that they're servicing. They have a number of locations. We probably now have six or eight locations and we're, we're, we need a thousand dollar minimum delivery. We go down, we take the farm down in a slideshow presentation, we hand out samples, we get people solidified, we have it at a mutual um, place. We have captains of the club, we give them a 5% discount. They bring in friends, they let us park in their driveway, they communicate with their neighborhood that we're really not a member of. And um, it's been a huge way for us to grow the market. And we've done that by going to a farm market, getting to know people. Or even if you know someone in the area, like, oh, yeah, I'd love to buy. Well, if they, if they know a dozen families and those people are serious, you've got a mind club here. So that's something that you can explore. Um, it, it, it's really helped us increase sales. Now we're in six days of sales easily with just mind clubs. Um, I guess I would open it up to questions, comments, um, ideas that you have. I appreciate the opportunity to 
talking about something that is so fun and exciting to do. Who says you most of your channel every week? Month. 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 And how do you do it? How do you grasp it? Fat in the morning. Okay, good. Very good question. See, in Cal Cap, I thought, well, all we need is just these and try, hey, get through the winter. You've got to have games like that with your grass fed animals. So we went to Haymitch. And we, we offer our cattle, our growing cattle, 50% haylage, 50% dry hay. And this haylage is dairy quality, very high protein. You gotta watch it because it can get too high. That's why we, we let them have dry hay too. But we have found that our yearling cattle do very well on a mix of haylage and grass hay. And I'd like to say that we're grazing right through the winter, but we haven't been able to do that. How many months old are your steers in the I know it's probably there in some of the but do you have a range? Of 18 to 22 months. It's my goal economically to process. So we're spring calving, and the calves that we buy are usually spring born. So it would be my goal to process them at 18 months before their second winter. Because winters in Northeast Pennsylvania are very expensive. Like for us, it's three to four dollars a day to hold a, a yearling animal on winter feed. But in actuality, we've got some great genetics that'll do it in 18 months, but really to get the finish and the marbling we want and to have beef year round, we know we're holding some cattle into 24 months. We know we're processing some at 18 months and that we could have added another 100 pounds and we look at the cost per day of that Sometimes it's cheaper to say, okay, we're at our target 550 hanging weight, let's slaughter that animal and put it in the freezer. Because it cost me, you know, 75 cents a day to hold it in the freezer, and it's three dollars a day even though I'm getting gained. So looking at things like that, but um, once you get into year-round processing, it adds in factors that in the old days we were like all in the fall, get our numbers low, just like in chickens. We don't have any chickens on the farm unless they're in a freezer come winter time, except for our layers. Meat chickens shut down in October because we don't have grass. Yes, ma'am. We started all in, all out feeders in the spring. We get, and we still do. We get about 50. Um, I purchased 50 to 70 uh, feeder pigs, about 60, 50, 60. 50 to 60 pounds, and they are modern factory pigs. They, they come from uh, a farm locally, uh, but they have a big pig house and they're land race. They do have a spot for um, hampshires, more of a modern, fast growing pig. And then we started getting into the pasture pig thing and silver pasture and keeping, really using the pigs in the woods. And so we started bringing our own pigs and we started with uh, large blacks. English large blacks and Tamworths and Gloucestershire old spots. And over time, we have favored the Tamworth spot cross. We use a, a, a Gloucestershire spot board on Tamworth sows. And um, we're having two new litters a year. So we do have to bring them into a barn setting and use deep bedding on an open barnyard in the wintertime. Um, but we're farrowing out in the woods come spring, and then the feeder pigs that we bring in are mixed with our pigs. So now we're offering like a heritage breed, different animal, looks different, much more fat, they're your old lard pigs, and some meat, redder meat, sweeter meat, personally I think, much more fat. We get a 40 pound tub of lard, which now we're selling all the lard we're rendering. Okay, lard with stock and sucrose has, has become very popular. Um, but it offers something different. It makes us a little more unique. And we were saying, okay, do those genetics work? Well, they do in some manners, and they're not as productive in other manners. So again, it's you know it takes you time to get the breed and the type within the breed. We're focusing a lot now on our Angus herd, like what we're looking for: um, smaller frame, fine bone, slick hide, uh, does well on grass, not a heavy big heavy cow, but a carrying cow. It takes time, but 
play around with different things according to your market and your farm's resources. Okay, um, I'll say, if you got any more questions, at least. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, happy to hang out, or I know that there's another question. Well, I was going to say, um, please make sure you fill out the 